This is my wife and our Jack Russell Terrier Banjo, preparing to slosh through a bog with our loaded bikes on our holiday. Or rather, my wife's holiday. Actually, sloshing through the bog was part of my work. Sort of. Let me explain. It was late summer 2021. I had somehow convinced my editors at a newspaper magazine that it would be a good idea to write an article about riding the tail of my canal, the more than 100-year-old waterway linking the coast of southern Norway with the interior of Telemite County. It turned out my wife had some holiday left and wanted to come along, which meant bringing our dog Banjo along too. Based on previous experience, the thought of manoeuvring two loaded bikes and a dog into the tiny cargo area of the coastal train didn't quite appeal to me. Instead, we embraced the bike's ability to cover large distances, skipped the train altogether and rode from home by adding a couple of days to our trip. All good, except that riding the whole way meant we would have to spend long days in the saddle. Not wanting to risk our lives on the westbound highway out of town, we decided to link a couple of forestry roads in the hills to the south instead. To add to my stress levels, I had this silly romantic idea that it would be a great thing to bring my old Fujifilm X-Pro1 with two prime lenses. That meant leaving my old trusty workhorse, the Nikon T600, at home. Now, the autofocus on the Nikon wasn't really anything to write home about, but the X-Pro1 crop camera was even worse. So why bring it? First off, the Fujifilm camera and the two lenses I intended to bring was a way smaller system. That's a pretty good point in itself. And then there was the tactile goodness with all the dials and switches on the X-Pro1 that reminded me about my very first SLR, the Nikon FM2. A lovely little camera where everything had to be adjusted manually, from focus to aperture and shutter speed. Finally, there was the mojo factor. I don't quite know what it is, but there is just something about the images from that quirky X-Pro1 that somehow carries with them the soul of the scenes I photograph. Probably not to anyone else than me, but still. Anyway, let's get back to the trip before I get totally lost down the camera rabbit hole. After more than 80 kilometers of climbing steep gravel roads, stomping in bogs, bumping on rough stony roads and fighting with traffic on the highway, we suddenly found ourselves running short of daylight. Ironically, we had been surrounded by forests with ample campsites all day, but we were now in farmland and struggling to find a place to sleep. We finally found a campsite down by a huge lake with enough distance between us and the nearest residential house to make it more or less legal. The next day it was time to get to work. Though our trip on the surface looked like a holiday on wheels, I couldn't hide from the fact that I needed to bring home a story and photos about riding along the Telemark Canal. I wasn't too worried about the story. But no images would mean no article. I had to bring home some decent images. It didn't take long before we bumped into the first lock. It turned out that the route took us straight onto the huge wooden lock doors, a perfect opportunity to grab a handful of shots and maybe a caper or two for the article. While we were still close to the canal, I got a shot of the canal boat as it passed by too. Bingo. The newspaper might not run it, but at least they had the option. Having options is always good. Shortly after, we hit the second lock of the day. I took care of getting a few quick photos of the lock before riding on, as it was the last lock we would pass. From here on, the road and the canal would part, reuniting from time to time. The landscape gradually grew wilder and wilder as we worked ourselves deeper into Telemike. The canal is first and foremost famous as an inland waterway. It was originally made to transport ragstone used for sharpening knives, Norway's oldest export commodity, and later to transport timber from the inland forests to the sea. The 105 km long waterway consists of several natural lakes. 18 locks take care of the 72 meter elevation difference between Dalen and the sea. Nowadays, it attracts thousands of tourists each year that are experiencing the canal from canoes, kayaks, or from one of the old canal boats. But well, the canal isn't just nice to explore from the water side. A bicycle route accompanies a large part of the canal from the small industrial town of Ulefoss and to Dalen, deep into Telemark County. The final section of the road is even unpaved and close to general traffic. In other words, a bicycle canal tourist wet dream, if you pardon the pun. If you're into skiing and the name Telemark rings a bell, you're absolutely right. Modern skiing saw its birth in Telemark giving name to the characteristic Telemark turn. 
The tourist information homepage calls the Telemark Canal one of the most beautiful waterways in the world. It was characterized as the eighth wonder of the world by the Norwegians when the final segment of the two major parts were completed in 1892, adding to the growing list of eighth wonders around the world. It was no doubt an engineering feat, linking the small town of Dalen with the coast through a wide landscape with rocky steep waterfalls. We had been struggling to find a nice campsite by the canal the evening before, but when we were running out of options, we finally found a sheltered spot down by the water. It was totally worth wrestling a bunch of thorny blackberry shrubs to get access to the spot. I got a few shots of the camp in case our next and last camp along the canal route wasn't quite as nice. I guess we could have stayed there all day, soaking in the landscape, drinking water straight out of the lake, bathe and just chill. At least if Banjo had a saying, but he didn't have a newspaper deadline looming on the horizon. We had to get moving. A blue sky only lightly dotted with the occasional cloud meant that I probably wouldn't get the most exciting photos midday due to the rather harsh light. But a blue sky meant great riding conditions and a fair chance of some wonderful warm evening light later in the day. Our ride on day 3 started pretty easy, as our route more or less followed the shoreline of the canal. An open air museum with old historical houses marked a change. A national cycle route had to leave the canal, as there simply wasn't any roads along the next section here on the south side of the canal. Instead, our route took us up a pretty steep climb. We were treated with a view of the barren mountains to the north, as we slowly gained height, the same mountains we would pass on the north side on our way back home the following days. It was time for a good lunch down in the neighbouring valley that ran parallel with the channel. I almost forgot I had a job to do when we had lunch, but realised we couldn't linger for too long. I knew it would be challenging to find a campsite near Lake Bandak, the last lake of the canal system, so we better pedal on. We were getting deeper and deeper into Telemark for each pedal stroke, passing small farms and watching the hillsides grow steeper and steeper as the lake narrowed. The sun bathed the valley with golden evening light, and if I hadn't known better, I could almost have been fooled into believing that we weren't riding in the middle of Telemark, but along one of the many deep fjords in western Norway. This. This was what we had come for. A gravel road without car traffic, meandering its way through the forest with a view to the wild wooden slopes of the valley to the north. I grabbed a few shots while we took a break, realising that taking photos while riding wasn't the strong side of the Fujifilm X-Pro1. Once strongly influenced by forestry activity, the northern slopes of Lake Bandak is now slowly regaining its natural state. We took our time riding, stopping to soak in the landscape, knowing that we would have to turn our wheels back home the next day. But first, we needed to find a campsite, preferably not right next to the road. That was easier said than done, as the terrain along the road was rocky and steep. Just as we were starting to fear we wouldn't find any nice spots before reaching the tiny town at the end of the lake, we stumbled upon a brilliant campsite down by the water. This was almost too good to be true. The cry of an osprey echoed between the cliff walls, a pygmy owl hooted in the mixed deciduous forest behind us as the daylight faded. I wasn't sure this campsite was super important for the reportage, but it sure was a highlight for us who are more interested in wilderness than canal logs. I made sure to get a good handful of photos. If not important for the reportage, they were the kind of images we would look back on years from now thinking, yeah, that time and place really was rather special. We had a relaxing morning the next day, watching one of the canal boats glide by under the majestic hillsides of the lake. Then we rode off, stopping briefly to admire the legendary wooden doll hotel and getting a few photos of the old building to round off the reportage. I had a feeling I had enough photos for the reportage, but if not, 
There was nothing I could do about it as we took on the rather brutal climb up from Dalen and away from the canal. With an average incline of close to 11% for the first 3 kilometers in the summer heat, we sure got to test our legs and lungs. We left the main road and the cars and found peace yet again on a small gravel road taking us into the hills and forests north of the canal. As we climbed our way up the water divide, we passed several forest lakes with hillsides not yet scarred by the clear cuts of modern forestry. Like almost all forests in Norway, they had obviously been selective logged, but by the look of the trees, it seemed to have been a while back. We would have loved to linger for a while, maybe even camp there, but needed to get way more distance covered. Instead, we kept pedaling and soon dived down into the town of Kvitesaid and a local supermarket for provisions. We ended the day with a ridiculously steep climb up into the hills north of town, but the reward was a view deep into the wild hills of Telmark before we pitched our tent for the night. Waking up on the fifth day of our trip, we knew we had a long day ahead of us. But sometimes, you just have to live in the moment, stop worrying and just savour your surroundings. After starting the day with the last section of yesterday's steep climb up from Kvitesaid, we treated ourselves to a late morning coffee by our lake with a view towards Brukefjell, with its remnants of old growth forest. We were both happy and sad riding through the forest afterwards. The whole area had surely been logged hard in the old days, but with time, the forest had grown and started to resemble a proper forest. A logging truck passed us and reminded us how modern forestry is eating through the Norwegian forests, scarring the landscape with naked clear cuts and leaving behind monotonous, even-aged forest stands with a fraction of the biodiversity of a pristine forest. And if it wasn't bad enough as it was, the logging clearly breached the industry's own environmental standards, leaving only a thin sliver of trees down by a lake, almost like mockery. I took some photos to document the breaches, but knew all too well that it wouldn't have any effect. We got to relax our legs on the downhills towards the Seljord Lake, known to be home of a monster similar to Scotland's Nessie in Loch Ness. As usual, we were optimistic about time, but the clock seemed to be ticking faster than our legs were spinning, and soon we found ourselves fighting the clock. Our plan of stopping in Bø, a small town known for its university where you can study outdoor life, or friluftsliv, as it is called in Norway, quickly evaporated. Instead of riding past town, we ended up riding straight to the hills north of town, attacking yet another mountain pass before diving into the next valley. And no, I didn't film any of that stretch, as I had more than enough on my plate trying to ride up the hills in a straight line without getting hit by one of the many cars zooming past with drivers obviously not expecting to meet bike riders around the next corner. I guess we couldn't have found a more boring place to resupply than the mall we passed in Nordtorn, but we needed to get to the woods before dark and didn't have time to be picky. We reached a picturesque forest lake just as dusk approached, setting up the tent for the last time on the trip. Waking up the last morning, we were spoiled with yet another sunny day. We enjoyed the lazy morning down by the forest lake before packing our bikes. I don't know whether Banjo was eager to get home or just enjoyed riding in his basket. In any case, he obviously wanted to get going. We rode off from camp with a wonderful realization that, even though we had a great time riding in Telemark, it still felt like an adventure when we rode into our own local backwoods. And the reportage? It did get published after all. <laughs>